And so what I started seeing over the years of doing, doing this was this common thread of these ultra, you know, high net worth uh, borrowers had usually two things in common. It one, either they were business owners or entrepreneurs, they built businesses, built value that way. Um, and two, they are real estate investors. And so that really, to me, just created a, a desire to kind of get into that side of it. And so I've got to do both now, uh, building a business and also investing in real estate uh, through Aspen. And um, it's been a, a really fun journey and can share all the ups and downs along the way or where we want to go. But um, yeah, it's kind of you know where we're at now. If you're in a asset class that is actually in a downward trend, but you vertically integrated, you've actually created an inherent need to continue to do deals to kind of feed the beast. Yeah. And you can actually make poor decisions because of that inherent need that maybe you don't even realize. But um, our belief is that vertically integrating, picking one asset class, going, going deep in one, isn't a terrible strategy. It makes sense. We've actually done that in a few different verticals that we focus on to first understand your overall investment strategy. What's your goal as an investor, right? Am I trying to maximize total return? Am I trying to preserve capital and generate income? Um, where do I, what's kind of my, my mix of investments in the capital stack, right? Am I 100% equity invested? I should probably have some investments in some debt um, you know, vehicles and you know, reduce risk that way. And then the tax conversation becomes that, that next part of it, right? But I, I do think, a lot of investors are so far, they don't even think about taxes until end of the year and what do I owe? But there are, you know, understanding the buckets of income that you generate and where you can protect uh, against that income um, and how you invest. That's a great way to, you know, create the framework for what things should I be looking at um, given my current tax situation that makes sense for me. Welcome to another episode of the Global Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Charles Crillo. Today, we have Ben Frazier. He is a chief investment officer of Aspen Funds, a private equity firm that Ben helped grow to over $500 million in assets under management. Before joining his current firm, he served as a commercial lender, a commercial underwriter, and an asset management on a team overseeing over $7 billion in assets. So Ben, thank you so much for being on the show today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Charles. Looking forward to it. So please tell us a little bit about yourself, both uh, personally and professionally, prior to getting involved and in joining Aspen Funds. Yeah, yeah. So you kind of get a little of the bio. So I kind of started my career um, in finance and banking and uh, was a underwriter for a while and then a, a lender for a period of time. So uh, business banking, did a lot of uh, real estate deals, uh, kind of small middle market mergers and acquisitions. Um, really kind of cut my teeth on the debt side, right? And so was able to learn a lot. It was really great training, um, you know, but you only kind of learn to look one directionally, which is downside, right? So as <laughs> banks, they don't get in the upside. All they care about is risk, um, but it's a great skill to learn, right? How do you assess risk? How do you manage risk? Um, but eventually it got not as fun, right? Because I, I kind of, projected where my career would be 10, 15 years down the road. And, you know, most of those people were pretty pessimistic and, you know, hadn't you know, probably made much more money than they had 10 years ago. And I was like, you know what, I don't think this is for me. And had opportunity to kind of join Aspen funds. And at that point they were pretty small, but had been operating for about five years and built a great um, operation in kind of their first vertical first niche. And, uh, you know, only raised from friends and family, but from that point, you know, kind of helped us grow to where we are now, about half a billion under management, raised about 200 million in equity from uh, high net worth investors and uh, really have awesome team now. So it's been really, really fun, you know, and what kind of prompted the, the move aside from just, you know, fear of getting stuck in banking. You know, one of the cool things I got to do as a banker was get to look under the hood of these very successful borrowers. And because we were a boutique business bank, um, all, most of our borrowers were entrepreneurs and uh, investors. And so what I started seeing over the years of doing, doing this was this common thread of these ultra you know, high net worth uh, borrowers had usually two things in common. It one, either they were business owners or entrepreneurs, they built businesses, built value that way. Um, and two, they are real estate investors. And so that really, to me, just created a, a desire to kind of get into that side of it. And so I've got to do both now, uh, building a business and also investing in real estate uh, through Aspen. And 
um, it's been a, been a really fun journey and can share all the ups and downs along the way or where we want to go. But um, yeah, it's kind of, you know, where we're at now. So with, with Aspen funds, it's, you have a pretty unique business plan um, compared to other maybe syndicators out there that might focus on one asset class. You guys focus on several different asset classes. I mean, what are your investment strategy and your kind of economic thesis when you're looking at different asset classes and making decisions on where to uh, invest and put your LPs funds? Yeah, absolutely. And it's a great question because I think it is a little bit different than maybe the, the standard approach a lot of operators take in that we operate in multiple asset classes. Um, and it really comes through the experience of our partners. So I'm one of four partners. I'm the youngest by probably 20, 25 years. So they've got a lot more experience than me. I got, I got the hustle muscle to you know drive things forward, but it's been, it's been a really great balance of being able to have the perspective that they've been through multiple cycles in real estate and private equity in the public markets. And, you know, some of the takeaways were the timing really matters, right? And I'm not saying market timing. I'm not saying, you know, timing the market perfectly and, you know, being a Nostradamus, but understanding what we kind of call the tides of the economy, right? These are longer term trends that are driving uh, changes in the economy over a longer period of time, right? Those can generally be identified and you can position yourself with the tides and benefit from that. And so a rising tide lifts all boats. We wanna be in the, in the asset classes and the verticals that have rising tides because our thesis is a rising tide creates a massive amount of margin of opportunity of outperformance over time then say choosing one vertical and vertically integrating for example maybe you take on construction in-house maybe you take on property management in-house but that can actually create a conflict of interest down the road right if, if you're if you're in a asset class that is actually in a downward trend but you've vertically integrated, you've actually created inherent need to continue to do deals to kind of feed the beast. Yeah. And you can actually make poor decisions because of that inherent need that maybe you don't even realize. But um, our belief is that vertically integrating, picking one asset class, going, going deep in one, isn't a terrible strategy. It makes sense. We've actually done that in a few different verticals that we focus on. But to save maybe 10% operating margin by vertically integrating, if you're in a downward trend market, that's actually not going to rescue anything, right? It's we'd rather be in an area where you have a lot more opportunity, a lot more tailwinds behind you to create more margins. So that, that's really the, the thesis. And, and so what we've done is our kind of tagline is macro driven uh, alternative investments. We look first at the macroeconomic drivers that we believe will, will be in play for a long period of time. And we can position ourselves, um, behind those drivers to benefit from them. So I can talk about what some of them are that we're looking at, but that's really our thesis of how we approach investing. Yeah. Give us a, give us an overview of uh, several kind of some of the asset classes, maybe you guys really focus on and, um, and you know, how you found those and what are the huge drivers for being part of those? Yeah. So, uh, you know, a few that we have, and we have a, a podcast as well, and we've talked about this a lot. So if people are interested, they can go and check that out. And we have a, uh, uh, an hour long presentation called our investable megatrends for the next decade. And it, it lays out seven megatrends. I'll, I'll just hit a couple right now, but um, one, and I think the one that kind of underlies a lot of these things that's going to, you know, we think going to be in play for a while is inflation. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been saying inflation uh, was is here to stay and um, you know been, been calling that for a little while. And we think it's obviously come down quite a bit. But it's floating about that 4% mark right now as we're talking, annualized, and the Fed has staunchly stood on the 2% number. Um, and while it feels like we're getting closer, that's still 100% higher than they want to see it, right? And so 4% is a small number, but on a big economy, that's a very big number. And the challenges that we're seeing right now, and the reason we've been saying inflation is going to be sticky, really driven by by a few things, foremost being labor shortages. We're seeing uh, pretty significant labor shortages across the board, um, but especially in skilled labor uh, uh, areas. And, you know, kind of coming out of COVID, we had a lot of, uh, you know, boomers and folks that were 
nearing retirement, decide to leave the workforce and they haven't come back. And meanwhile, we've continued to have, you know, growth of the economy, but we have very low unemployment right now. And that's going to continue to, to drive wage inflation, which drives overall inflation because consumer spending makes up about 70% of the GDP. Um, And then the other kind of big driver of inflation is energy costs. And this is another one of our mega trends is, is, uh, um, uh, petroleum, uh, you know, energy based, uh, things. So that's really the other kind of driver of this is you got inflation from labor shortage, you've got energy. Um, there's been a massive underinvestment in new supply for, uh, oil and gas development. It's very inelastic. It's something that we think is going to create a pretty significant energy crisis over the coming years and going to create higher energy prices, which again is very infla- uh, inflationary. It's not you know, a direct component of CPI, but it impacts all components of CPI. And so if you believe inflation is going to be in place, you want to position yourself in an area that you can benefit from inflation, right? So most, most areas of real estate are great places to have a hedge against inflation. Um, but there's certain verticals right now that we think are better than others, right? Multifamily is in a challenging position. Um, and so we're actually taking a different approach. And the other kind of big trend that we're seeing, a really big opportunity that we think is, is going to be around for the next several years is really what we're calling kind of gap funding, right? So we're seeing in this market a lot of deals that were originated the past several years use bridge financing. And it is very attractive to a lot of newbie syndicators um, because very high leverage and non-recourse. So you could get, you know, 80 to 85% leverage on a project and, um, you know, didn't have to raise as much equity. And hey, it's non-recourse. I don't have to personally guarantee this loan. That, that's the best of all worlds. Well, the only thing that you have to kind of trade for that is floating rate debt. And at that point, no one you know, even consider that rates would go up as much as they have, but lo and behold, they did. And we've seen the fastest interest rate increase that we've had in history. Um, and it has really impacted a lot of, a lot of deals, right? Cause not only do you have higher interest costs, uh, on servicing your debt, um, we have massive, uh, increases in operational costs, right? We're seeing insurance costs go up massively across the board, property tax, you know, is going up as these property values are being adjusted. Um, and then meanwhile, we're seeing the biggest amount of supply hitting the market in, in a lot of markets, mostly Sunbelt, of new developments that are, you know, were started three, three or four years ago. They're now just hitting the market. Yeah. And we're seeing the highest level of deliveries of new apartments and housing in general hit the market at a time where, you know, there's other things going on. So it's kind of a perfect storm. And so what we're doing is we've been operating debt funds for a long time. We're big believers in going lower in the capital stack. And right now it's very, very uh, accretive to go lower in the capital stack. You can reduce your risk of capital loss, but you can still actually demand pretty high uh, rates of return uh, because you're this last equity or, or debt in and, um, you know, they don't really have any other options because banks are pulling back massively, right? They're mm-hmm. tightening their credit. It's very hard to raise equity right now from high net worths, especially syndicated deals because everyone's freaked out, right? No one wants to do a capital call. And so there's not a whole lot of options. And so that creates demand. And so that's another big vertical and, and area we're focusing on uh, this year. Yeah, it's really interesting, Ben. Do you have money sitting in the stock market and you're worried about it? Or worse, you have money sitting at the bank, not keeping up with inflation? My name is Charles Carrillo, founder and managing partner of Harborside Partners, and since 2006, I've been investing my money and my family's money into income-producing properties. These are real assets, real properties with real addresses that produce real cash flow. At Harborside Partners, we provide passive investors who love real estate with a turnkey investing solution. If you want to put your money to work in real estate but can't find deals, don't have the time to get funding, and the last thing that productive people want to do is manage real estate. We find the deals, we fund the deals, and we manage the tenants, the termites, and the properties. Partner with us at investwithharborside.com. That's investwithharborside.com. Go to investwithharborside.com. If you love real estate, you like the idea of passive income, and believe that income-producing properties will appreciate over time, go to investwithharborside.com. That's investwithharborside.com. So just, can you just explain a little bit more about gap financing? Because it's not something we've really 
tackled that much on this podcast. And can you explain how you have the senior debt, how you have common equity and where you guys are coming in in that mix? Yeah, great question. So, you know, for those that are maybe less familiar with the term, the capital stack, right? That's really what we're talking about here. And so to purchase any asset, you have to have, you know, formation of capital. And that's generally most commonly, you know, some, some form of senior debt, whether it's from a bank or a debt fund or a uh, life insurance company or agency, whatever, that's your senior debt. That's what most people are familiar with, you know, buying, um, originating uh, senior debt. Then you have equity, right? You got to go raise equity. Maybe the senior lenders, you know, a couple of years ago, they were doing 75, 80% leverage. So to purchase a million dollar property, they'll give you 800,000. You got to go raise or invest $200,000 to kind of um, bring in the equity. But what's happened now is both of those pieces have kind of pulled back, right? Yeah. And so senior debt, the leverage ratios, depending on what type of project it is, whether it's development or value add, you know, if it's not a stabilized project, which most people aren't investing in unless they just want, you know, preservation of capital, leverage ratios have come way down. So we're seeing like on developments, 50%, 55%, you know, value add, maybe 65, 70% if you're, if you're lucky, or you can go higher, but you're paying a massive amount for it from a debt fund, right? They might go 75%, but you're paying, you know, seven, eight, 9% interest rate to do that. Meanwhile, equity, it's difficult to raise equity right now, right? Equity investors, they don't know what the market's going to do. Um, equity investors get paid last. And so when, when the market's kind of risk on, that, that's a harder part to raise. So what we're coming in at is either in a preferred equity position, which means we're coming in as equity investors, but we have a preferred uh, payout in the waterfall of distributions, whether it's operational cash flow or you know, a capital event. Um, we're going to get paid first with the kind of uh, the current rate of return plus a back end. And uh, then it's so, some circumstances will come in as a mezzanine debt. So they're both you know, functionally come in before the equity, but after the senior debt, um, you know, the mezzanine debt were generally secured um, and it's more structured as a promissory note or like a debt like product, but functionally they kind of operate the same and you come in, you kind of come up to say 70 or 75% overall leverage. So the property value can drop, you know, 25 to 30%. We still haven't lost any, any principal, right? The equity investors will get wiped out in that scenario, but we still preserve capital and we can charge, you know, rates of return that are probably pretty similar to what equity investors were making a couple of years ago. Right. But they have no other options because they can't do capital calls. The equity investors won't contribute. Banks aren't willing to put new money out on existing pro projects. So it's kind of creates this gap. Right. And, and there's, there's a big spectrum of, you know, distress deals and some are just, they're just bugs looking for a windshield. There's no amount of capital that's going to save them, right? It's they purchased it way too at way too high of a basis. Um, the business plan was never realistic. Um, the you know, I, mean, I was talking with a a group the other day. They're they're at ninety one percent occupancy, but they are negative cash flow <laughs> still. And why is that too high of a basis, right? And the, you, there's not a whole lot you can do to, to get out of that um, other than just accept you purchased at the wrong time and probably gotta take an equity wipe and, you know, move on. But there are deals that are purchased at a good basis. They have a proven business plan, but either the lender is requiring them to bolster up reserves, right? Which lenders are doing. They're saying, Hey, you need to have X amount just in cash, just as a reserve. Um, maybe they've, done part of the business plan of renovating units. I'm thinking multifamily right now, but they need to finish the business plan. They've kind of proven out the model, the rents are there, but we don't have the cash to go finish the renovation program. Um, but we have a path to stabilization to get there. Um, or it's buying an interest rate cap, right? Be you know, a lot of lenders are requiring interest rate caps to be purchased, which basically limits the um, upside exposure to interest rates. And those are very expensive right now because, um, you know, a lot of them are expiring and people still don't know exactly what interest rates are going to do. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why people are in these positions, but they're good assets in good locations with good operators that just need to kind of get to stabilization to be able to sell or to refinance. And those are kind of the projects we're looking at.
Yeah, great, <laughs> great, great point. You know, I, I always say, you know, never let the tax tail wag the dog, right? And that's, that's a common phrase, but I see this all the time, right? Especially at the end of the year, we're kind of now in 2024, so less of it now, but a lot of people have a need or have a fear. Oh, I got to pay so much taxes. I got to just make an investment, right? And, and this happens a lot in a space that we're heavily invested in, which is oil and gas, right? There's amazing tax benefits in oil and gas investing, but there's certain strategies that will give you great tax write-offs, but they're also really, really risky. <laughs> and so you're, you're making the investment because of, you know, the write-offs, but if those, you know, strategies don't bear fruit and they don't work out, you have a permanent write-off of a capital loss, right? Of zero. So that's not something that you, that's, that you don't win in that scenario. Right. And so that's where I just think it's so important to, to first understand your overall investment strategy. What's your goal as an investor, right? Am I trying to maximize total return? Am I trying to preserve capital and generate income? Um, where do I, what's kind of my, my mix of, investments in the capital stack, right? Am I a hundred percent equity invested? I should probably have some investments in some debt, um, you know, vehicles and, you know, reduce risk that way. And then the tax conversation becomes that, that next part of it. Right. But I, I do think a lot of investors are so far, they don't even think about taxes until end of the year. And what do I owe? But there are, you know, understanding the buckets of income that you generate and where you can protect against that income um, and how you invest. That's a great way to, you know, create the framework for what things should I be looking at um, given my current tax situation that makes sense for me. But again, just looking at a, you know, a big bonus depreciation year one as the primary driver is usually uh, too myopic in your, in how you're viewing it. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of great information. I think uh, with when I get to spend time with savvier investors, it's really before they're even thinking of uh, selling an asset or having any type of liquidity event, they have already have a plan of really where they're planning on putting that money. And becoming more like that of forward thinking, I think, is a great way for investors, especially ones that are uh, investing in alternative assets where you do have tax consequences if you're outside of your retirement account. Totally. Yeah. We see it all the time. Right. And if, if someone is going to have a big liquidity event, you're going to get hit very hard in taxes, right? If you just sell it all and you're one, you get a huge lump sum of cash. You're not keeping a lot of that, that cash. Right. And so being able to, to even structure buyouts, if you're selling a business in certain ways um, to, you know, prepare your situation for how you can, you know, manage a new lump sum and, ways to offset some of those uh, tax liabilities. Uh, becoming a real estate professional is a, is a game changer if you have the ability to do it. Um, so there's a lot of strategies that you can employ, but to your point, you gotta be forward thinking about it. You gotta be anticipating some of these things before they happen because once that tax year is over, there's not a whole lot you can do retroactively, right? And so you, you have to be thinking ahead of time. So uh, moving forward with that in uh, strategies you might see, I mean, you have a podcast, as you mentioned before, Invest Like a Billionaire. So over the years of working with uh, ultra high net worth individuals, what strategies do you see them employ regularly that may differ from mainstream investment strategies or stuff you hear on your typical news? Yeah, you know, I, th I think it, it depends on where you're kind of coming into uh, investing from, right? If you're in the public markets exclusively and you've said, oh, I've been investing in, in real estate through REITs, you know, I would argue that that is a, um, an equity investment that tracks the real estate market, but it's not true real estate, right? And, be, and there's so much difference between investing in a publicly traded REIT versus investing directly into a real estate fund or syndication that has direct ownership of an asset. Because when you do that, you can accelerate depreciation. Um, you can even do bonus depreciation and cost irrigation studies that, that, that uh, kind of create a big lump sum on the front end that can be used against other passive income. And so if you're just kind of new to it, like just starting there is a massive game changer, right? If, if you can start to start generating these, these passive losses through depreciation, um, that's, that's a pretty big deal, right? If you've already been doing that, you're kind of, you've been investing, you're generating these, these losses. Um, another great strategy to think about as I, as I alluded to is becoming a real estate professional. Um, it's, it doesn't work for everybody, 
And it helps a lot if you have a spouse that, you know, maybe isn't working or has the ability to be more active in real estate, you know, whether it's buying rentals or even Airbnbs, sometimes those can qualify, um, working with property managers. Because if you can hit the status, I'm not going to go into that right now, it's for time's sake, but if you can hit it, it can be a massive game changer because if you're you know, married filing jointly and one of your spouses or one of the spouses is um, a real estate professional, all the income generated at that family unit uh, is now can be sheltered. Um, active income can be sheltered from these, uh, these passive losses. And that's, it's a pretty big game changer. So I've known several friends who, you know, one spouse is a business owner the other one was working full time and he ended up actually leaving his job. He was making like really strong six figure salary because they realized we'll actually make more if I stop working and I become a real estate professional and just manage a couple of rentals or Airbnbs. And now I have all my time back and we'll make more through tax savings than the income that I'm generating as a W-2 employee, right? And this is a scenario a lot of people could be in if you're a high, high paid working professional. T to me, it's the single most powerful tax strategy that you can employ if you can figure it out. Um, if, you know, and if, if you can save, you know, 30 to 40% taxes per year, you know, especially earlier in your wealth building career, you can compound that savings and investing. I mean, it's just, it's insane what that can do for your personal financial situation. If you can, if you can achieve that. Yeah, that's a great point. Being that real estate, having one of those real estate professionals uh, in the family there uh, allows you really to shelter a lot of that income and kind of kick the can down the road a little bit further. But um, as we're, as we're kind of closing up here, Ben, um, you know, you, as you're dealing with a lot of these high net worth individuals, I mean, what are common mistakes you, you see alternative asset investors make? Yeah. Common, common mistakes. I think the, the foremost would be, you know, I think investing because of only tax reasons is one. It's probably not the worst mistake. The worst mistake I would say is not educating yourself enough to understand how to do basic due diligence, right? And I think that's where a lot of people get stuck, right? Where they feel like I just don't know what to do. So I'm not going to invest in alternatives because I don't know how to make a decision, right? That That's one end of the spectrum, but it's not terribly complicated. It's not rocket science, right? If you've been able to generate a net worth of a million, a couple million bucks, where you're making half a million bucks in income, you're smart. You can figure this out, right? It's not, it's not rocket science, but you need to do enough just basic education of understanding the right things to be looking for before you really start going all in on, on, on alternatives. So I, I see a lot of people in this boat where they um, were a business owner, they now sold a business at a big liquidity event. They have say 10 million bucks, 20, 30 million bucks, and they're just ready to go all in on investing. And I just say, go as slow as you possibly can, because the investments you'll make on the front end, you, know, you probably won't make all of those five years down the road because you'll learn a lot of things uh, along the way. And so as much as you can go slow, learn as much as you can. And it, you know, some of the basics of due diligence are, are not that complicated, right? But just trust trust, but verify, right? It's kind of a simple, a simple idiom that's really, really helpful. And as humans, we all innately, um, we trust people, but a lot of times the trust isn't necessarily rooted in logic or rational thinking. A lot of times it's emotional, right? And it's emotional beings, you know, we make decisions emotionally and then we justify that decision logically. And so we think we're logical when we're not. And a great case in point is, you know, Ponzi schemes, like there's a Ponzi scheme that's kind of come through and it's still alleged. So I can't say it's a Ponzi scheme, but, uh, you know, evidence seems to point that direction of this group that had gone through all these kind of private investor networks, um, was this carbon capture technology they created to capture carbon, you know, from wellheads and they raised $250 million from accredited investors. And it appears that it was a Ponzi scheme from the outset and uh, most of that capital is gone. And there's some pretty basic stuff of just from a diligence standpoint that could have easily shown that this was not legit. Right. And um, one is doing basic background checks on, on operators. Um, but also like they, they claim they had patents, right. Um, but they couldn't share those patents with anybody because they didn't want the competition to, to see them 
and you know this to get out before they could do it well if you have any basic understanding of, of a patent it's it's filed with the government right so you can go into the patent office and, and see the, the patent number apparently no one decided to go check that that was actually legit um and so this is stuff like that where it's like you as humans we kind of innately want to trust people but that we also just got to verify and so um that that's kind of you know some of the basic stuff here yeah that's a lot of great information one thing too you said about education i just want to add there is just investing in the things that you understand um not i don't want to say like one asset class or another but there was asset class out there and people were all this stuff that was happening a couple of years back mainly with crypto let's just say and people would say something to me and i'd be like and i would ask i remember i was playing golf with someone and i was like like do you understand uh like how that work i i didn't understand myself i was just seeing and nope no <laughs> idea i mean you know what i mean i somehow knew more than they did and i didn't know anything about it and it was just um that's a huge red flag i mean that's just you're preparing yourself for failure that's saying you have to be in the trenches of like you know managing properties to passively invest but it's something that understanding is kind of how the business goes you know what i mean and i think if people did more of that then when they do their due diligence and they review a deal they'd be pulling things out and they're like oh i heard this was like a red flag let me you know speak to someone about that 100 percent, you know and i've i talked with uh, a gentleman who's the founder of a group called tiger 21 recently so a, a large network of ultra ultra high net worth families and he makes the contention you should even go so far as to only invest in things not only that you understand but that you have a significant competitive advantage in right so if you have a if you exited a company in biotech right you have a distinct advantage of identifying good private equity investments in biotech right like why would you go and try to become a crypto expert i mean maybe you could but you have this inherent knowledge that's taking you a long time to develop why not use that to your advantage in your investing strategies, right? So I, I think th there, there's some, you know, arguments on both sides of that. But at a minimum, I agree with you that you should invest in things that you at a, at a pretty good level understand, right? And Warren Buffett says, you know, invest in what you know. I mean, it's just, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's almost too simple that we just assume, you know, well, Uncle Jerry's investing in this and he's smart. So I'll just go do that. Well, that, that's how you get into trouble, right? And you lose, you lose money. So I think it's a great, great point, Charles. So, uh, so Ben, how can our listeners learn more about you, your podcast and your firm? Yeah, we have a podcast that's called Invest Like a Billionaire. Uh, it's really focused purely on passive investors, education around uh, leveling up your passive investing and, and really mimicking the strategies and tactics that the ultra wealthy like the billionaires are using. Um, and then we have our, our private equity firm called AspenFunds.us. Uh, we work both with LPs, family offices, and fund to fund managers. So if you're, you know, liked any of the macro trends that I shared, you can reach out to us there and uh, see more of what we've got going on and, and offerings we're putting out. Well, thanks a lot for coming on today, Ben. Looking forward to connecting with you here in the near future. Thanks, Charles. It was great. Hi, guys. It's Charles from the Global Investors Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you're interested in getting involved with real estate, but you don't know where to begin, set up a free 30-minute strategy call with me at ScheduleCharles.com. That's ScheduleCharles.com. Thank you. Nothing in this episode should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Any investment opportunities mentioned on this podcast are limited to accredited investors. Any investments will only be made with proper disclosure, subscription documentation, and are subject to all applicable laws. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Syndication Superstars, LLC, exclusively.